From the Spec Network, this is Fragmented, an Android developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better Android developers. I'm Don Felker. And I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to the show. We are back this month with the highly anticipated Part 2 Flutter episode with Eugenio Marletti. Now, if you thought the first episode was interesting and was almost a sort of teaser, well, this one, we take it to a new level and talk about all of the interesting details. We touch on Dart 2, the third-party library bridging, how one would do testing with Flutter, how is performance, how do the internals work, how would you build an app with Flutter about the different components. This is chock full of a lot of details, and I hope it continues the excitement with Flutter. Listen on and on to the show. Many thanks to Microsoft for sponsoring today's episode of Fragmented, and they're here to promote App Center, which is a continuous integration, delivery, and feedback suite of cloud services for Android applications. With App Center, you can automate your Android app development lifecycle, such as build, test, distribute, monitor, and push to ship five star, higher quality apps faster and with more confidence than ever. Building a development pipeline for your Android apps has always been a challenge, but with App Center, you can get started in minutes. Simply connect your GitHub and Bitbucket repos and build in the cloud test on thousands of real Android devices, distribute to beta testers and Google Play, and monitor real-world usage with crash and analytics data. As a fully modular suite of services, you can pick and choose the service you need and connect it to the tools that you already use. Sign up now at appcenter.ms and spend less time managing your app lifecycle and more time coding. Got it. And okay, so the other thing is, I know Dart 2 came out at some point, right? Like, So what is the difference between that? Was that like a rethinking of Dart or was it just a natural sort of, uh, it's just a version upgrade as with any other language or did something fundamentally change with Dart 2? I think it is fundamental in many ways. So when Dart was created, um, because I guess it was trying to, to, to fight with JavaScript and something like that, um, it was a dynamic language. So types were mostly, uh, as usual, just a, you know, a hint, uh, and they were definitely optional. Um, after a while, they realized that actually types are nice, surprisingly, um, and they help you catch a lot of bugs, especially when you have uh, large uh, scale applications because it gets unmanageable otherwise. And um, what they did is that they introduced uh, the so-called strong mode, which was uh, compile time safety that would make types not that optional anymore. So in strong mode, you actually have to specify types um, in a way that is uh, guaranteed at compile time that things will not blow up in your face. Mm. And the interesting part is that this is only compile time because then at runtime, you actually don't have that guarantee. So you can potentially actually have things that still blow up. Um, once they saw how how powerful this was, and and by the way, Flutter has always like since the very beginning used a strong mode, so you cannot use a dynamic Dart in Flutter anyway. Oh, okay, um, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, yeah. Oh god, yes. Um, but now with Dart two, essentially they said, okay, that's it. No more dynamic typing. So Dart two is uh, statically typed, and there's like. This is the new foundation of the language, which changes a lot and allows a lot of optimizations finally, um, and a lot of cool features that, that uh, can move more in the direction of Kotlin, for example. So I guess like another question I had along the same lines is because we're using this whole like different language altogether, like with Dart, right? There are some things that I've come to like with uh newer languages, like for example, Lambda is in Kotlin, right? Mm-hmm. Like obviously that's a huge draw. Uh, so I guess my question is, do I get to use the same libraries that I do, uh, like, you know, like Rx Java, a lot of these things, or is there like an equivalent that's in Dart that I have to now start using? Uh, or what's the landscape there? So Dart, again, it's familiar in many ways. Like, um, it's definitely better than Java. Uh-huh. It has a lot of the, yeah, a lot of the cool features that Kotlin has. It has uh, some support for uh, nullability. Uh, like some nullability operators, like the the Elvis, if I'm not mistaken, it has the uh, question mark dot operator to uh, to check if something is null before accessing it. Uh, a few things like that. It has lambdas. It has uh, high order functions, uh, generics that are better than Java. They actually are reified at runtime, oh. which is amazing. Nice. Okay. Yes. So no more uh, type erasure. Um, and 
and they also have a surprisingly good and and complete, I would say, uh, standard library. So they have things like streams, um, which you know it's like it's almost like having Eric's Java integrated, embedded into the, the the system, and pretty much whatever you can think of, it is part of the standard library, or there is a package for it somewhere, which is crazy. But I guess again, Google had to create a lot of that in order to to make the language work, and it is working really well for them. Um, it also has, for example, a support for async await uh, and futures. Um, although I like more the calling approach, which is much more abstract and allows you to do even more than that, but still, like it's nice to have it. Uh, you know, a few things like that. Like it's it's a surprising language in many ways. Interesting. So the. Uh, Go, go ahead. ahead. No, sorry, go ahead. Already, no, no, already, no, no, go ahead. Question was already answered. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I so if I wanted to use the new library, right? Because now I'm trying to think. Okay, I'm going to start using Dart. Like, what are the first few things that usually come to mind, right? Uh, if I'm using like third party libraries, Irish Java, you mentioned. I guess there are equal and uh, there's equal and stuff there in is Dart. That makes sense. Dart. There's <laughs> Irish Java. Oh, yeah. oh, nice. Even better. Which is made <laughs> by Brian. He also lives here in Berlin. <laughs> Um, okay. He's doing a lot of community work lately, so you probably see his name popping up. Uh, he's doing now like a Flutter cookbook, so all the recipes for for stuff that you would do usually. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, what I want to say, yeah, it is still based on top of the uh, streams that, that the language provides. So this is just like a very thin abstraction layer to give you more of a Eric's Java feel than anything else, um, which is interesting. But yes, so the way this ecosystem works is that you cannot reuse like entirely uh, whatever things you were using before. So if you want to use retrofit, right. you mm. can't. Yeah, you would need to do mm -hmm. it in Dart. Although there's a caveat here: um, you can use the existing platforms as much as you want. So there's something called platform plugins, which allows uh, Dart, um, Flutter to communicate with the host platform and <gasps> It's almost oh. like sending messages back and forth. So it, you can treat the host platform as if it was even like a, a place on the internet or whatever. Um, but it's very easy to set up and you send these messages. And so you can have, I don't know, a native implementation of something done on Android and on iOS and Flutter does something else. You can have hybrid apps that are partially in Flutter and partially in the host system. Of course, the downside of this, which might not be a downside for you, um, is that you have to write it per each platform in this case. Well, if you do it in Dart, you automatically uh, ship it to both platforms at once. So that's your trade-off more or less. So that brings up a good question. Um, like if we do want to do common things, like if I'm used to using something like Retrofit and I'm used to using something like Timber for logging mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. these common tools and libraries, um, is, I mean, are these some of these things been replicated already? Like you said, RX Dart's kind of been replicated, but is there a, a wild and flourishing community of library developers already? Yeah, or there is. Are we still at the very wild west cowboy stages? <laughs> no, no, they do an amazing job with um, like the official uh, official package repository, essentially. Um, that that holds all, all the like proper packages, let's say, and they're even rated based on how active they are, uh, what platforms they support, because there's Flutter, but there's also like Dart uh, for, for servers, for example, and things like that. Um, and so that is good. And it has a lot of plugins already. So, and it's surprising how much stuff you can find and more and more people are writing these kind of things. But also you realize after a while that Flutter, like if you code in Flutter for days, you realize that everything else is irrelevant in many ways because it's just so much better. Like it changes the way you approach anything. And the fact that the hot reload, oh yeah, because I didn't say about the hot reload. It's not just fast. It's like blazingly fast, like under a second fast, always. Oh, wow. It's not based mm -hmm. on how big your app is. Even if you have an app with like a million lines of code, it's still as fast as the hello world. Um, it's based on how much code you actually changed. So if you only change a small portion, it's going to be a very fast reload. And the slowest reload you can have, it's still like a second or two, like maximum or something like that. Even if you do like a full redeploy of the Dart code, it's still like seconds. It's never more than that. It's crazy. And so what happens is that it changes your entire style of coding where you just experiment a lot more because you keep on 
writing something, saving, writing something, saving. And every time you save, you just look at the app and see what happened. And so this, this exploratory way of coding, um, I think in a way, like takes away the need to use a lot of the tools you would normally use to inspect what's happening because you can literally see what's happening like in real time. That's and so, great. Like you log a lot less, for example. So I just want to dive into my question a little bit deeper here. Um, for, you know, because we're all Android developers here and all the folks who listen to the show are, if, like I say, I am building a, a Flutter application and I do need to use some type of HTTP component and I'm looking at the, what's it called? The pub.dartlang.org, which is where I look at the packages for, for Dart. Mm -hmm. What, you know, for example, if I want to do HTTP communication and that's going to be doing the communication for both iOS and Android, of course it's Dart based. What would you recommend go looking at if I'm already familiar with something like Retrofit? Is there any package you would recommend saying, hey, maybe start here and then kind of explore out from that point? Um, so that's a good question. Uh, the point is that right now, especially it's, it's exploding. So okay. every day you see new things getting added and, um, I expect a lot of the familiar tools, as you said, like retrofit, I don't think there's yet something kind of like retrofit. Um, but they were talking about it, um, before. So I, I would not be surprised if at some point it just comes out. Um, and again, since. Dart allows sometimes to do things in a way that is less verbose than Java. Um, yeah. You can, like, often you don't even need the, the, the commodities that, that you would have with something like Retrofit, for example, because you can do it differently. One thing is that the, the community is huge and there's a uh, super nice, like, weekly newsletters that if you want to keep yourself updated. Um, if you Google for it now, you find a lot more information and there is, like, a Gitter um, chat um, which is very active and, uh, the, the flutter people are all there and they reply to you personally. Um, so maybe finding information is less easy than for something as mainstream as Android, but finding help is definitely a lot easier because people are very, very willing to help and not just anyone, but like the people actually making flutter. That's fantastic. Reminds me of the early days of Android when you can hop on the Google group and actually talk to the, the Android team. Yes. Yes. So one question I also had in regards to to Dart and to Flutter, so it's kind of combined here, is one of the biggest gripes that us as Android developers have had, and I know Kaushik felt this way as well, is that testing is a royal pain in the oh. butt on Android. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> what has been done or anything at all to help facilitate any testing in Dart? Is, is testing bolted on afterwards? Was it built into the framework? Is it part of the design consideration? Or where does the entire testing... Um, kind of landscape look like in Dart and Flutter? So thank you for asking this, because I was dying to talk about <laughs> this. Uh, testing is amazing, of course. Uh, so you have everything you would expect. So you can do the classic uh, unit tests on the code. Um, you can do the, the instrumentation test, as you would expect. But the really amazing part is that if you use the, let's say, the highest layer of Flutter, which is the React style API, which is normally what you would want to use, you can unit test your UI. Oh, so yes. You can essentially run on your laptop tests that test the real actual UI structure. They don't draw on the screen, obviously, because it's sort of a headless uh, thing. Yeah, of course. But it's just so good. It's crazy. So, And they have amazing tests that test things that you would never imagine are possible. Uh, but it's, yeah, it works really really well a follow-up question i had was like oh then can i write the same good things that i have with espresso but what oh it sounds like it's like better. they have actually yeah they have something even better than that yeah yeah and again it was not an afterthought at all like they they this is what andrew should have been since the very beginning like this is yes. it has no <laughs> yeah, no legacy it was created from the ground up in a modern way with all the best practices from engineers that have a ton of experience um, and it really shows. Um, also, again, since you ship the entire thing, you can read all of Flutter code. At any point in time, you can jump inside any definition of everything. And the code is very, very readable. Um, like, okay, sometimes things are happening and you might not exactly know uh, what's happening because you don't know the internals, but you can still follow exactly, you know, step by step, which is great. When I'm following those internals, am I looking at C code or am I looking at Dart? Dart. Again, unless you go really deep into the engine, which is not something you do normally. Just this, knowing this right now, that there's testing is built in from the ground up, that this is 
uh, I can execute fast unit tests. To me, this is what I have been looking for in a language for mobile for a very long time. And it's one of the biggest it, frustrations yeah. in Android. And to hear this makes me want to jump over immediately and just start oh, yeah. playing with Flutter right now. A funny aside for listeners, uh, I mean, Don, Eugenio, me, like we've, we've met a couple of times and we know of Eugenio as being like this huge Kotlin sort of like proponent, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, I know if he loves his Kotlin, he loves him some good Kotlin. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so when I started to see him talk a lot about like Flutter and being so excited, I was like, "Wow, there's something interesting here." Because like you know, I know this. It 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 take it, it would take a lot to convince him, and like the fact that he's so convinced is definitely something interesting. So I'm definitely with Don here. I I can't wait to sort of uh, try and hop on like Flutter or at least try it out. Is there like any recommended Hello World kind of application that they have, or like you know, uh, yeah, so where we get sort of started? Um, when you create a new project it creates the, this Hello World app, which is a great starting point, in my opinion. There's some tutorials and guides on their website, and they had this massive uh, gallery application that, by the way, you can also play with just to see some of the crazy widgets and things they can do. Um, oh, nice. But all the code is, is online, obviously, and so you can just jump in that code and see how they did stuff. And it's so, so useful to, to see uh, existing patterns just implemented by them through that. Um, yeah, so that's it. And again, as usual, like once you get the basics of it, everything else gets a lot easier because you understand that you can always jump in and see like, oh, I'm, I want to use a card. Well, this is a real example. I wanted to use a card, mm -hmm. like a material card, uh, but somehow I cannot, I could not customize the, the rounding of the card. I was like, ah, mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. Now I'll have to rebuild the card widget from scratch. Yeah. I jump into the card widget and it turns out that it's just a few lines because it wraps a different widget and it just configures, uh, configures it in a specific way. And so what it did is I literally copy pasted that, changed the configuration and boom, I had a customizable card widget in like nice. you know, five lines of code. It's insane. Um, and it's all like that. It's Lego blocks that are put together in ways that allow you to to create anything you want pretty much let me ask you this um regarding flutter and dart and everything one of our biggest gripes and we talk about hot reload which is awesome but one of our biggest gripes is compile times what do <laughs> compile times look like in dart if i want to actually ship my app or I, I need to compile a a binary of some sort to give my qa team or something like that what do those look like? Very, very fast because, okay, so there's two parts of the compilation. And one part is the native, like Android iOS part, which obviously uses the those tool chains. So you still have, I don't know, the, um, the bundling of all of that. But the point is, because this is not using Java, it doesn't need to be dexed, for example. There's, by the way, no method count uh, limit. Just, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so the only thing it has to do is to compile the, the Dart code to ARM, and that's super fast. Um, so I don't want to say bullshit, but it's really like, I don't know, I don't think I ever had a compilation last longer than a minute, perhaps, but probably less. Uh, it depends on the size of the app, of course, and many things, but also the point is you, you ship release versions of it so rarely that it doesn't matter. Like, it really does not matter. So yeah, that, that's it, I guess. Um, oh, one thing I wanted to say about Hot Reload that I forgot before. It's even crazier because say that you have this example like before, your counter, right? Um, and every time you change something, the counter remains the same. But say that at some point you actually crash the app, right? So the whole screen, or at least the, the portion that, that you broke, becomes all red and shows you on the display um, what's happening. If you fix the, the error and then Hot Reload, the state is still there. Interesting. So it survives even beyond app crashes and death. Yes, it's crazy. <laughs> like, of course, there are um, some times where you change the structure of like the data structure so much that it cannot hold the state, of course. But in general, for day-to-day -day development, especially the UI part, it just changes everything, really. It's so cool. So how does like the crash reporting stuff work? Because now I'm curious, right? Assuming you're I have my production app and, you know, my app crashes, right? Uh, whatever that means in the world of like Dart and Flutter. Mm -hmm. How do I have equivalent tools like Fabric or Crashlytics? Like how how do you like 
debug crashes and stuff with apps in Flutter? Uh, no, first of all, debugging, by the way, is fully supported as you know one would expect from a modern framework. Like you can uh, step into the code, you can set breakpoints. So, so I can put like debug points on my yes, ID yes, and yes, it yes. just okay. so that's fine. okay, awesome. Um, for crashes, you have access to the equivalent of a stack trace in Java. Uh, whenever a crash happens, and you can send it wherever you want. I think they created one integration with uh, some service. Was it Crash Analytics? I don't know. I don't remember. There, There is something, and they are, of course, like expanding that, and it's really not hard to integrate that with anything. Uh, but it's definitely possible anyway. So Yeah, I'm looking on the, uh, on the plugin site right now, and I see actually, um, we, we actually had a recent episode about App Center. I see one here that have App Center crashes. There's a, another app, they, another crash reporting options inside of the packages mm-hmm. as well. So there's some plugins already being written, which is kind of cool. Yeah. 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 So I guess another follow up I had with something that you mentioned before, right? Where you said, like, oh, it's easy. You can have both Android code, like, you know, your platform plugins, or you can have like native stuff and you can have Dart side by side. Uh, does that mean today I could basically start building? I could maybe have a screen because a common thing that's always like most people at like big companies ask is like, hey, can we share code, right? Mm-hmm. Do you think with an existing Android app that I have today, I could say, oh, maybe I want to start off with one screen, right? Like I want maybe a help screen or a settings screen or something that I want to write in Dart. Do you think that's a recommended approach where I have both of them together? Or do you think usually it would be preferable to start anew? I mean, if you can start over and have it, all directly in Flutter, that's always better. Like, of course, because it's the, the best approach you can you can have. Um, having part of the app in Flutter and part of the app in Android is definitely possible. And yes, you can do it. And if that's the only way you can introduce it um, and you want to use Flutter for the right reasons, not just because it's new and stuff, then yes, you can definitely do that and you should. So um, you can both have like an entire screen, but you can also literally like Flutter is a surface view in the end. So it is a view in the, the Android world. And so you can have that even inside an existing screen, if you want. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's a canvas. that It's a window directly to OpenGL and Vulkan. Uh, so, nice. You know, it's like Google Maps in many ways. That's, that's just like so fascinating in so many ways to me. Like Because this is like a concept that many people thought of before, right? Like if you use yeah. like a game engine, that's why games look the same on most exactly. like, sort of... <laughs> Uh, platforms, right, in iOS and Android. And so it's nice to see that they adopted that approach, yeah. but for like the regular UI stuff that we use day to day. There is one difference with games is that this doesn't have like a, like a constant refresh rate. Um, and it, right, right, like mm. it, it really wants to be as efficient as possible to, to consume as, as little battery as possible, while games don't care. <laughs> At all? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, because with games, it's important to hit that 60 FPS, right? Because otherwise, like, you start calling the game janky, but it'll probably, like, you know, uh, destroy your battery. But hopefully, (laughs) with Dart and uh, Flutter, that's not the approach. It is a specific goal of Flutter to have the best uh, battery smooth performance and hit uh, 60 FPS all the time. So it's not like they sacrifice performance in that sense. No, no, no. Um, But first of all, they don't have to do crazy shading or 3D rendering that games do, obviously, or post-processing effects or anything like that. Um, and second of all, they, they have a much more like tailored approach to, to how they invalidate the, the UI, um, which is super, super smart. And it actually comes from the fact that they can use this React style approach. Um, and it's, I mean, that's a whole different topic. There's a video uh, from one of the creators that um, briefly digs into this, and it's fascinating. Um, but essentially, their layout, mm-hmm. generally speaking, uh, linear time. Like, they only do one pass-ish. Um, and so that makes it oh. super fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the invalidating doesn't happen in, like, squares. It happens in trees. And and it also oh, nice. is, is a trick that makes it super fast to to understand exactly what change, etc. Uh, plus, whenever they can, they use the like integrated um, textures on the GPU or composing tools. Uh, and again, to make it to make it even faster. In many ways, if you think about it, um, what they achieve is that they made the entire app a recycler view. So whatever you do, you, you're essentially recycling things every time, not just when you're doing a, a list or scrolling, everything you do is essentially recycled. Um, so actually, yeah, we should talk about the, the whole reactive 
functional reactive API because that's amazing also. And it's one of the, the best parts. Let's maybe quickly touch on the functional reactive uh, stuff, right? So I know I, I've heard of this and like, you know, I've read about this like in docs, but uh, so can you tell us how like Dart is functional and reactive? Is it like, as we understand with like Rx Java and a lot of like these functional languages? Oh, no. Um, I mean, it's not in that sense. So um, um, as I said, Flutter is is made of layers, okay? So you have the the lowest, lowest layer is like, you talk to the GPU through that code. Okay, that's the lowest. And that's the engine, pretty much. On top of that, you essentially have like a, a canvas. So your entire app is one big canvas. There's no layout, there's nothing. You literally draw everything on the screen. And you can you can do that if you want, you can use that layer. But, you know. Oh, so I could actually dive in. If I was curious as like an experiment on the side, I could try to do literally the exactly. same thing. Actually, there is, again, another talk from um, another uh, founder of Flutter that uh, shows <laughs> the same app created at every layer. And it's as crazy as you can think of. Like uh, at, the, at this layer, you have to manually calculate the position of everything on screen, which is crazy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And every time you, you need to change something, you end up either manually keeping track of what change or refreshing everything, which is not efficient. <laughs> nice. Okay. Then there is an extra layer on top, um, which is the, the render layer, so-called, which is much more similar to what Android is. So you have this, let's call them views. They are render objects, but still, um, which are mutable. So they hold the current property uh, of this thing you're drawing. Like it can be a... a a square, a circle, something. And every time you change a property there, um, that invalidates uh, the, the screen and redraws, which is fine. But then you end up having the same problem that Android has, for example, which is you have two phases. In the first phase, you create the UI the first time. And then after that, you have to keep the UI in sync um, with your state. And that is where like 99% of the bugs come from. It's about manually keeping track of all of that. State is really hard to maintain. Yes, right? like that's, totally, I mean, totally. State is a lot of the newer things that are coming where they have like unidirectional data flow and exactly. like immutable data yes. flow. A lot of it is driven by this precise problem that you mentioned where it's always really tricky to keep state and what you want finally as output in sync. Especially without boilerplate and um, by by changing as little as possible to, to optimize for, for drawing as little as possible, right? Um, and so what they did is that there is an extra layer, which is the widgets layer, um, which sort of borrows uh, a style that was introduced or, or at least made famous from uh, React. And that is you, you describe your entire UI as one immutable tree um, of immutable widgets, which are not exactly what you're going to draw on screen. They are a representation of information that you use to actually draw something on the screen. So imagine more like, a, imagine a JSON description of what you want to draw, which is then sort of, again, in quotes, parsed from an, another part of the system. And the part of the system decides based on that what they actually need to change. But what this does is that you make your UI one pure function where you just have an input, which is state, and an output, which is one immutable tree. And what they do is that they diff this tree and see exactly what has changed. And so you write the function once, and that includes both creating the UI with the right state. So it's creation and binding in one step. And that works so, so incredibly well. That is pretty insane. Um, and it also allows them to understand exactly what has changed and where in a very efficient way. A lot of the stuff that you said where you have like the binding and the state as an Android developer or as like, you know, a, a Flutter sort of uh, API consumer, say I have a feature I need to build, right? Uh, I have a text that needs to like change text. How would I go about that? Can you like walk me through like, what that would look like? Yes, yes, yes. Um, there's, so as a, I would say as an optimization, there's two main um, classes of widgets. One is called uh, stateless widgets, which are generally uh without state, as you might imagine, which doesn't mean they, they never change. It just means that you always recreate the entire widget whenever some data changes. Uh, so this is the kind of stuff that if you traditionally think about data binding and like you want the state to be reactive, this is that kind of uh, components where it's essentially like, hey, 
when the screen render is just recreated, I don't care once, recreate the whole thing. Oh, no, but imagine that you mix and match them. So um, but Flutter has like a fractal architecture where everything is a widget. And I mean, literally everything. So you start from like your, your text label is a widget, your button is a widget, your screen is a widget, and your entire app is a widget. Oh, All right. and this is similar to like React's component thing, right? Yeah, like where yes, everything yes. is a component. And, and it's cool okay. because okay. you can literally have an app that is just a UI piece. Uh, you can develop that separately and then bring it back and compose multiple parts however you want. So that's that's one part to, to understand. Um, the difference between stateless and, and stateful is that the stateless widgets uh, cannot tell the UI tree that they changed at all. So they will always remain the same unless you literally replace the entire thing. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, text is a, a widget, which is uh, stateless. And so every time you change the text, you replace that widget with something else. Let's put it this way. You have a build function, which is the main entry point to where you go from the state to the UI tree. Okay. It's called a build function. In this build function, you return more widgets by composing them. And so if you have something that every time you click a button, you change it, uh, uh, the text, you would have something like in your build function, you return a button widget, which inside has a text widget and the text widget will be always a new one essentially. But maybe your parent widget is stateful and a stateful widget <clears throat> has this cool thing that I told you before where the state is preserved because it splits the the actual widget from a state object, which is bound to it. And so what happens then is that every time something changes there, uh, you have to call a specific function called uh, set state, which is telling the system that something actually did change. And when that happens, it calls again your build function and you have a chance to uh, pretty much recreate the, the entire tree um, with the new information. Very cool, very cool. So at this point, I think... I sort of understand like with Dart, I understand like the Flutter framework or like how to go about like building some of these things. I want to like step back and, you know, uh, talk about some of the other questions that obviously would come up, right? For example, uh, how does this compare with some of the other solutions out there, right? Uh, like we, React Native and stuff? Uh, yeah, like React Native, there's Xamarin. And I know like, I, I believe even you gave a talk about like using Kotlin Native, right? And trying to use like code sharing code mechanisms. Sharing, yes. Yeah. Uh, so can you maybe like run us through like how this compares with some of the other solutions and why do you think like, you know, Flutter is like a good way forward or like what are some of the advantages and disadvantages on both ends? Yeah. Um, so with the whole thing about code sharing and UI sharing, first of all, those are two separate concerns. Um, if you only ever wanted to share code, um, Kotlin might be a better alternative, especially once um, Kotlin native will be fully ready. Um, because that really integrates with the existing stuff. So like in Java, it will be, uh, sorry, on Android, it will be JVM. Um, and on iOS, it will be like Objective-C or Swift, like native uh, stuff. While in Flutter, you always have to send messages back and forth, which is not the same. So that's one side. Um, and if you talk about UI sharing, that's something that it's really hard to do in general. Um, I think the best out there might be React Native when you want to reuse the existing um, widgets. But if you don't, or if you're limited by the existing widgets, Flutter is the only solution you have in that sense. Like the point is with Flutter, you don't depend anymore on the fact that Samsung changed the UI <laughs> or Samsung specific <laughs> bugs, or the fact that on an older version of the system, that UI is different, like, because you don't care anymore. Does, is this what you meant by uh, unsamsungable? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's it. yes. I love this. A good this term. Is, I'm definitely going to start using this everywhere. Yeah. I mean, unless they literally break the OpenGL drivers, which I'm sure they absolutely can, but uh, that's a different <laughs> concern. Uh, yeah. And again, like they normally, if they customize the, the Android system and, and change stuff and fragment all your APIs, this is not a concern with Flutter because, again, you are drawing everything on screen. And a common thing, at least like with React Native, was always that, you know, animations were not smooth enough. Mm. You know, that's like the most common thing that people would say, like, oh, I have a list view with a thousand items or a hundred items. And as I keep scrolling it fast enough, like React Native just doesn't uh, scale as well as 
a native list view. Is this a concern with Flutter? Absolutely not. It's one of the best things. So, so you need to consider what's happening. In React Native, what happens is that you compute your logic on a different thread in JavaScript, which is generally fine because people normally don't do heavy logic like uh, processing an image or something. It's more like deciding about something and that's fast enough. From there, you have to cross the bridge to a different thread, go from JSON to essentially something that uh, the rest of the system can understand. So that's like a, some parsing and marshalling involved. Then the system needs to see that, change the UI through the Android framework, for example, and then that in turn has to go all the way through and draw it on the screen. So that's the whole uh, cycle, right? Oh, in Flutter, interesting. And this has to happen at every single instant. Like every time I scroll, like a lot, this is happening, exactly. which is where like the performance impact comes exactly, in. Exactly, exactly. In Flutter, it's like in the same place, let's say, it literally decides. So let's do it like uh, how you do it, like you're scrolling, for example. It diffs the tree, which is super fast. It decides the small things to change and it draws it on the screen. Done. Like, it's like so, so many uh, less steps than before. Um, it really reduces the whole like hot path from, from decision to drawing on the screen, uh, which is what makes it so fast, including the fact that it's really optimized for, like it has this recycling uh, embedded into the whole framework. So, oh, interesting fact. Oh yeah. Um, recycler view as a component, it doesn't exist in Flutter because scrolling is not using a special view. Scrolling is just doing the layout every time you move the finger. So it's, it's optimized for whatever yes. the use case is. It's, it's not even like, the point is the entire system is optimized so much yeah, that scrolling saying, yeah. is just something that happens. It's fine. I mean, there's still a lot of um, involvement into, you know, uh, transitioning the gesture to doing stuff, sure. There's the physics, there's like all the effects, like the action bar doing crazy things, sure. But as far as layout goes and recycling the views, that doesn't happen because it's like for free. I'm just sitting here thinking about how you have the Android team at Google who's working on the Android operating system. And then you have the Flutter team, they're working on something where they're just they're just drawing straight to the screen. They're saying, you know what, forget all these views. Like we're just gonna draw straight to the screen and optimize however we know we need to optimize internally, which is a totally different view on it, but it kind of makes yeah. sense. It's also many people ask me, oh is this gonna replace Android? And it's it's not that's that not easy. The question yeah, that's not the right question. Yeah. Like they can run in parallel even forever. I mean maybe eventually they could converge into something or um, if Google releases a new operating system that we will not uh, name and, <laughs> and maybe you have support for both at the same time in, in the same way, maybe it's fine. Or maybe you are going to be able to transition your Android apps little by little to Flutter. I don't know. Um, but even if that never happens and you will always have both, it's fine. Like they have each has their own purpose, I think. So I remember asking you this question about like, oh, uh, how does it compare with Kotlin native and code sharing there? But it's actually very different now that I think about it, right? It doesn't, it's not even like an apples to apples no. comparison here because Flutter, like the sharing that's happening here is at a very different meta exactly. level. Does yeah, that make yeah. sense? It's almost, <laughs> it's almost not really sharing. Like you're really the yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, there's. I mean, it's literally just the words that you have typed that are being shared, right? Yeah, like, yeah. other than that, everything is sort of. I, I really kind of feel like this is how mobile development should be done. Like, I kind of write it yeah. once; it's performant on both platforms, and it just works. You know, I mean, that, that's kind of the whole thing with React Native too. But we know that there are some limitations and some issues with it that we've already kind of hashed out, and there's other ones too. But this kind of feels like. If they were able to do Android from the ground up, you know, this is kind of what it would have been and it could have compiled to, to iOS as well. It just, I don't know, it feels start, starting to feel more natural. Yeah. And again, like, um, if especially if you have a very customized UI, oh, this is for you. Like, this makes it so much easier. There's nothing you cannot change. Um, and they have some really, really crazy uh, nice things. Like the scrolling system is one of the most impressive piece of software I've ever seen. Um, I, you were saying animations uh, uh, before a while ago. Um, animations are just part of the whole widget thing. Animations are immutable. 
So again, they are like an immutable representation of something that is happening. Uh, and there's support for going from one value to the other and just creating an, an intermediate representation, uh, the support for physics-based stuff. Uh, it's, it's really oh, well wow, done. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you can create uh, physics simulations. <laughs> I had uh, a couple of follow-up questions. So one is, we're talking about iOS and Android now, right? Does Can I use the same engine for Flutter and maybe even write like a web application? Is that so, something that is um, in... Right now, they specifically say that their core is mobile. That being said, there is nothing stopping anyone from making Flutter run on your toaster. Like, it, it is designed... <laughs> and, and I'm not fully joking there. Uh, it is designed to run everywhere. And so I'm really expecting, and I know that this will happen for sure at some point, um, a desktop version, because... Absolutely, why not? Um, I don't know on the web, honestly, because the web is very different. And to make it run on the web, you, maybe if you use like the, the web assembly stuff, maybe that could be. Um, but I don't know. Um, I don't think the web, like, that's probably like the last resort, I believe. So this has been full of awesome information. To be honest, about halfway through this conversation, I kind of wanted to just... Uh, drop <laughs> off and just like use the rest of the time that we had allocated for this call to just start hacking on like Flutter. That's really what I wanted to do, but um, kept on talking here. Now, that said, uh, everything has disadvantages. What are some of the disadvantages or caveats when using Flutter that you have ran into or that this should be known? None. It's perfect. No, no change. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Clearly. No, um, be, before I answer that. So, like, I cannot stress this enough. Before anything, you have to try it. Like, you have to try to build something with it. I I had the, the luxury to to do, like, a spike at my company. Uh, for three days, I coded only in Flutter. And honestly, it kind of changed my life. Like, it, you really find joy, again, in programming and everything. It's really different. And going back is hard. So... Kaushik and I talk about that a lot about the, and we talk about that offline a lot about the, the joy of programming and about how certain languages offer you that joy. And to hear you say that really uh, makes me happy because that's something I feel that uh, that kind of gets lost in the day to day to day grind. And uh, if Dart yes, and Flutter can bring that true. back, that's a humongous added benefit to it because being able to enjoy what you're writing while you're doing it uh, is a humongous benefit. So that is the first point. Um, this is advantages. Well, okay. Of course, um, it was alpha before, now it's officially beta, um, which means, it means something different than most people think. Um, since they were so aware... Is it like Gmail beta? Or uh, is yeah, it like... exactly. <laughs> since they were so aware of the fact that Google tends to over-promise and over, you know, sell things that are definitely not ready uh, as fully finished products, uh, they wanted to do the opposite. And so they went the, oh, let's let's you know, uh, under promise and over deliver uh, what we have, which kind of worked because if you use Flutter today, it's impressively mature for, for what it is. It already does most of what you need for, let's say, normal apps. And again, Google is using it internally. So there is a reason why they are. There are, of course, some things that are missing, but um, it's mostly about adding more features on top uh, while the core is very, very stable and all the, let's say, all the hard problems have been solved, which is something that they often say. And it's true. Anything that could have been a blocker ever is completely out of the way. Um, so it's really about adding what's left. And it's really about of like a matter of prioritization and, and time than anything else. The other thing is that um, similar to what happened with Kotlin, until it becomes like officially approved in many ways, although this is from Google, so it's kind of different, but uh, today finding Flutter programmers might be harder than finding a Kotlin programmer, for example, sure, mm -hmm. um, or, or convincing your company that you should do this, because then what if you quit and other people have to join and they don't know about Flutter? Yeah. This is a concern, of course. Um, my hope is that it will become so mainstream and so quickly that you know this will go away like um, happen for Kotlin. Uh, oh, sorry, quick question I had. Uh, is there like a limitation on the kind of APIs I can target or is this like, does this go back to like 
any API. Like if I if I'm using like a KitKat or like a Jellybean phone, can I write a Flutter app? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the limitation is API 15 or 16. Oh, that's Maybe. fine. I don't know. Yeah. Oh. For Android and for iOS is uh, 64 bits, and which is, if I'm not mistaken, the 32 is deprecated anyway now. Um, like I, I've, I'll be, I'm gonna be 100 percent transparent here, and as most people who know me on a personal level, I have a JavaScript holds a very uh, special place in my heart because I've been doing it for so <laughs> long, for 20 years almost, right. and that mm-hmm. really turns a lot of people's uh, you know, minds of me in the Android community because a lot of people hate it, hate JavaScript, and it's okay, whatever. Um, and so when I had the the discussions around React Native, like I was very excited about React Native, and I always have been, and. I've always kind of had this weird thing of like, ah, there's this Flutter project going on, whatever. But now I understand like what's going on deep down in Flutter and what it can do. I'm really excited to actually go over and start writing Flutter apps. Like this is something I really want to go try. And I I really can't wait to go, you know, get my feet wet and really see what I can build. And I think like what you said is most people can do themselves a favor by by sitting down and just trying to build a simple application. Even if it's a to-do style app, you know, do a to-do style app work with persistence, try to communicate with an HTTP endpoint, do those those few common things you're familiar with to build that common level of understanding, compile it down to an iOS and Android app, see what happens. Oh yeah. And I think that's where a lot of, and like you said, spend full three days or more working in the language and see how it changes you. I think that's a very good tip. Mm-hmm. Say I want to target some native things that uh, come from the device, right? For example, I'm thinking native libraries like barcode scanning libraries or maybe location stuff uh, that we inherently know to be part of the Android uh, framework of course. Uh, directly, right? How would the equivalent stuff work in Flutter? Does, is Flutter able to use those same things or do we basically expect someone to write like the Flutter equivalent before we can start using it? Oh, you're going to love the answer. So <laughs> Flutter allows you to write um, plugins which are a way to for, for interacting with the, the host system, right? It can be either for one specific platform, like Android OS, or both. Um, and that's the beauty of it. Like you can ship this integration with the host system um, with the native code for platforms as one plugin. And so you only need to do that once. Like say that you want to access sensors or a camera or, or a library, like OpenCV, for example, right? You do that once by creating this sort of... Uh, API or interface in Dart that communicates with the either one or both host systems. And then you ship it as a package and anyone can use it. And it just looks like Dart from, from Flutter side. But I, I, I suppose someone does have to take the effort to write that first package. Right? Of course. But again, like everyone has the same um, requirements. Yeah. Yeah. So right, right, yeah. That's... It, it will happen. I'm assuming a lot of these are already done too, right? Like the common ones? Yeah, 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 definitely. You can already access a lot of stuff on the system. So, yeah. So we've been going through all different kinds of stuff about Flutter. I already want to get writing Flutter apps. I know that Kaushik does. Some of the listeners are probably driving to work, home from work, doing the dishes, whatever. They want to get started. What are some of the resources that you might be able to point folks to so they can get started developing for Flutter? Yes. So the official website is really surprisingly good. Um, it has a lot of nicely written guides and it takes you through um, all the basics you need to know. And again, a lot of it is just doing stuff and looking at the source code. So that's one part. Nowadays, there's a lot of resources um, that people have been creating. There's like a Flutter University or Institute, I don't remember. Uh, there's there's newsletters that uh, contain a lot of content. Uh, people have been writing a lot of articles. If you just Google for it anywhere, all the stuff you find today is actually pretty good um, because it it cannot be old in many ways. So it's all relevant today. Um, and it's written by, by people that are very passionate uh, about Flutter. Um, so it, it really shows. So it's going to be good regardless, let's say. Hey, Eugenio, this has been an absolute pleasure. You've got definitely Don and me super stoked at least. Totally. And I think we're going to try this out uh, on the side if folks have questions what's a good place to do that definitely twitter where i post non-serious stuff all the time <laughs> <laughs> and you have an interesting handle and uh it's yes. working kills and if folks want to know the story behind it we did have uh oh, Eugenio, that's um, right on a Google I.O. episode. And in that one, he gives us, he reveals the secret to his yes. uh, nickname. 
<laughs> so go take that episode out. Yes. Yeah, we got to give a little homework. I mean, we talked right. so much about Flutter and made it easy. Why not give a little homework there, right? <laughs> yeah, write a Flutter app to scan the archives to find that episode. No, I'm kidding. It would be a waste of Flutter power, but yeah. Waste of power. All right, Don. And I know you're going to be stuck in that blizzard. You're going to be home. You're going to start uh, working on some side Flutter apps. Where should folks reach out to you to find out how that adventure goes they can always follow me on twitter at uh, don felker or instagram as well which is the same handle don felker and kaushik i know that you'll probably be heading home this evening and firing up your ide to test out dart and so forth and where can folks follow your adventures i am kaushik gopal on twitter and the same handle on instagram and folks can definitely reach out there All right. This has been a blast. Thank you all so much for listening. We will catch you in the next episode. Thanks again for coming on, Eugenio. Want to automatically build, test, and release your Android apps? Try App Center. Connect your repo and within minutes, build in the cloud, test on thousands of real Android devices, distribute to beta testers, and monitor real-world usage with crash and analytics data. Spend less time managing your app lifecycle and more time coding. Visit appcenter.ms and get started for free. That's it for the show, folks. Fragmented is hosted by Don Felker and me, Kaushik Gopal. We edit and produce all the episodes here on Fragmented. Sarah the Amazing Jackson from the Spec Network helps with production assistance and wraps our final mix. Our theme and ad music is by the national recording artist Blueprint from Weightless Recordings. You can find more Fragmented episodes at fragmentedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you in the next episode.